the quiet whispers of your grandchildren, the punchline at the end of a joke, the music of your favorite song. When you suffer from hearing loss, you miss the sounds that make life fun and fulfilling. But you do not have to miss out. At the JFK Johnson Rehabilitation Center for Audiology, a doctor of audiology will evaluate your hearing and recommend a personalized treatment plan to enhance the quality of your life. And best of all, today's hearing aids are small, are advanced in technology, and many are rechargeable so you never have to change a battery. Trust JFK for the highest level of clinical expertise and technical know-how available in the hearing healthcare field. If you want to enjoy all of life's moments again, call the JFK Center for Audiology today, conveniently located in both Edison and Monroe Township. Visit jfkaudiology.org. That's jfkaudiology.org. Or call 732-321-7063. The information provided in the following program is not a substitute for or intended to be medical advice. Medical advice can only be provided to you by your personal physician. Hello again and welcome back to another edition of the award-winning JFK Spotlight on Health. It is Bert Barron. Great to have you spending some time with us this week here on the program. And our guest who is with us this time around, it's a sort of a return visit, if you will, because we've had this guest on with us previously. He is the Medical Director of Neuro-Oncology at Hackensack Meridian Health, the Central and Southern Region, and here to talk about some of the things that he does, some of the programs that are going on, and also some information about some trials. It is great to welcome back Dr. Joseph Landolfi to JFK Spotlight on Health. Doctor, welcome back. Great to have you on the program today. Thank you. It's really great to be back. Uh, Let's jump in and talk about uh, something that's got a really cool name. It sounds like something in the next Avengers movie, the the good guys and the bad guys would be fighting over this. Uh, But it has a real-world application and a critical one as well. It's the gamma knife. Uh, I think some people have heard the term, but maybe not uh, completely sure what it's about. Can we begin our conversation with uh, a discussion on the gamma knife and what that means? Sure. So the uh, the neuro-oncology program for HMH, which really covers the whole state, um, including uh, my, my colleague up north, Sam Goldust, uh really is dedicated to the overall treatment of patients with uh, primary and metastatic brain tumors, so brain tumors that are, arise from the brain itself as well as um, disease or, or disease, cancer or lesions that spread from another part of the body. Um, we have a full uh, complement of uh, people in place. It's a full, comprehensive, multidisciplinary team approach uh, that covers the full spectrum of care through symptom onset, diagnosis, treatment, uh, follow-up, rehabilitation, and survivorship. So uh, the program has been well-established for many years. Uh, Gamma Knife, which I like to call the icon, uh, the newest uh, model of the machine, uh, is one of the modalities that we use to treat certain types of brain tumors. Um, for example, acoustic neuromas, meningiomas, cancerous lesions that spread from another part of the body. The, the icon, uh, because it's a misnomer to call it the knife, as there's no cutting involved, it's a non-surgical method for treating certain types of brain tumors, uh, allows us to focus very closely to the edge of the tumor, the radiation that we're going to deliver. It's sort of like giving it a shot, uh, a strong punch, rather than spreading the radiation over many weeks, we're able to do it either in one day or for certain size tumors, perhaps over five days. We're, el- we're able to do this uh, without the placement of a stereotactic frame on the patient's head. Although you can use a frame for certain diseases and certain tumors, there is the versatility with this icon of doing it without the frame, which is more comfortable for the patients and I think most people prefer. So um, the way the machine operates is we actually get an MRI scan and we're able to see the MRI scan in the planning software. We actually draw a line around the tumor everywhere the tumor is seen, and then we're able to focus and place our radiation spots just within the confines of the tumor. And then the patient goes to treatment, uh, automate it with the machine, and depending on the the size of the tumor or the number of tumors we're treating, it, it can be anywhere from 20 minutes to a couple of hours uh, that they're in the machine. Completely done as an outpatient, does not require uh, hospitalization. Uh, Done usually before noon uh, when the patient comes in that same day. Wow, very interesting. And you said it's a technology that's been around for a while. Are we talking about decades of a successful track record with this technology? 
Oh, absolutely. The first gamma knife, I believe, was placed in the United States in 1988. Uh, the technology, however, has been around since the late 1950s and has undergone several reiterations over the years, uh, basically uh, making it more accurate, uh, making it more patient-friendly, more doctor-friendly. Uh, and, you know, as technology advances in general, so does the technology that we're able to bring to the in service of the patients. You had mentioned that this is uh, designed to treat tumors. Uh, is this effective in maybe uh, skin cancers or any other type of cancerous growths, or is it just more uh, focused on, on treating tumors? Yeah, the ICON is specifically designed to treat uh, tumors that are within the confines of the cranial vault. So uh, brain tumors, skull-based tumors, tumors that are at the, the lower part of where the brain sits. Uh, it is, we can go as far down as the upper cervical spine. It is not used to treat um, cancers of the body. It's not a radiosurgical device that we can use to treat cancers of the body. We have another device called the True Beam Edge, I'm sorry, the True Beam, that is used to treat uh, the body in, in that sort of focus, what we call radiosurgical focus type of uh, radiation treatment. Interesting. And I, I've seen some, some videos recently of people that are having various procedures done in an emergency room in, in a surgery setting uh, where the patient is awake while the doctor is performing a, a, a procedure or two. Um, for something like this, doctor, is the patient conscious while they are receiving any sort of gamma knife treatment? Yeah, the patients are always awake, uh, fully aware of their surroundings. We typically put music on for them to listen to. Uh, there's a nice mural on the ceiling for them to look at uh, while they're getting their treatment. So it's uh, we make it as pleasurable as experience as possible, considering the disease that you know we're treating. Um, some of the surgical techniques you're talking about, we do here as well. So when tumors are in a very eloquent area of the brain and we're concerned about particular deficits, we uh, do non-invasive MRI scans called functional MRI scans that can help us locate where the tumor is in, in relationship to critical areas of the brain. But we also have the capability of doing what we call awake craniotomies or surgeries of the brain where the patient is awake, uh, either with or without mapping, so that we can safely remove the tumor without causing permanent neurological deficits in the patient. Something that I always just found so fascinating. Uh, is the gamma knife more effective, doctor, the earlier the tumor is discovered in a patient? You know, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh, some tumors actually take decades to grow, and so when they're very small, the, um, the plan may be just to observe it on serial MRI scans, and when we see some evidence of growth, then we'll recommend an intervention. Uh, we certainly don't want to treat uh, tumors that aren't growing, particularly if they're quote-unquote benign tumors. However, uh, the, for cancerous lesions of the brain and some of the benign tumors, the smaller the tumor is at the time of treatment, the higher the dose in some cases we're able to give, and so the better control that we have. So we do like to treat earlier rather than later, but again, it depends on the tumor type, the location of the tumor, um, you know, we Again, we have a very strict uh, multidisciplinary team where we're guiding that therapy as to what's most appropriate for the patient for that particular tumor type. All right. Just getting underway on this week's edition of JFK Spotlight on Health. We'll come back, spend some more time with Dr. Joseph Landolfi. We'll talk about some trials that are underway at Hackensack Meridian Health and also how you can perhaps become a part of a trial. And also the doctor is going to elaborate on something called surgical theater. Now, I don't know if this is the kind with popcorn and soda, but it is saving lives. And we'll talk about that coming up next on JFK Spotlight on Health. Welcome back to JFK Spotlight on Health. My guest this time around is Dr. Joseph Landolfi. He's the medical director of neuro-oncology at Hackensack Meridian Health Central and Southern Regions. So he oversees the programs in several counties and several hospitals uh, across our state. So I thank him for taking some time to speak with us today. Uh, before we talk about clinical trials, which I'm always fascinated about, doctor, uh, where can someone go to get some more information, not only about our topic today, but really just about the wide array of services that are offered? Certainly you can go to the uh, jfkmc.org website. For the uh, brain tumor program, I encourage people to contact uh, the uh, HMH, JFK, and Neuroscience Institute at JFK. Um, I have a clinical trials uh, manager by the name of Charles Corbetti, as well as the neuro-oncology nurse navigator, Patty Anthony, who can certainly answer questions about the program. And for those people who are in the southern region, uh, Joan Holman uh, at Jersey Shore Medical Center, 
uh, and Kara at uh, Riverview Medical Center can help answer some of the questions about the program and sort of be the access points to get patients plugged in. All right, terrific. I appreciate that information. Uh, clinical trials, Doctor, I've talked to a bunch of people over the years of hosting this program about trials. Some are very brief, maybe several weeks in length. Some trials are years. Some trials are decades. When it comes to clinical trials for your specific uh, type of work, uh, talk about what a clinical trial would involve uh, for what you do. So, um, as most people know, clinical trial is uh, research. Um, the I think the the misconception is that people are, quote-unquote, uh, being treated like guinea pigs. Uh, in fact, patients who enroll in clinical trials tend to do better. Uh, it may be because they're followed more closely because of the, the rules and guidelines of the clinical trials themselves. So um, clinical trials, for what I do uh, in neuro-oncology, is mostly around malignant brain tumors. Uh, they tend to be months or years long. There are some that are, that are briefer. I am somebody who has a strong interest in immunotherapies and uh, the way that we can get the immune system of the body to attack the tumor. So I've done um, probably about, uh, been a principal investigator probably on about 34 clinical trials now over the years. Uh, Some of the uh, clinical trials that I've been involved in, such as the Novacure clinical trials, which is an actual device. Uh, that's worn for patients with a certain type of brain tumor, um, have published data and are now FDA-approved treatments. Um, there are, there's a tokogen trial that we've done in the past, and that will be continuing on next year, which is a modified virus that's injected into the uh, cavity where the tumor is removed and creates an immune reaction against the tumor cells that are left behind. There's very good published data on that, and I hope through further trial, we'll see FDA approval. Currently, I'm involved in uh, two clinical trials, one that is utilizing an, a modified adenovirus, a different type of virus, for patients with a uh, recurrent tumor called glioblastoma. And what happens is the patient gets a pill before surgery takes place, and they get the pill after surgery takes place and then every day thereafter for a finite period of time. At the time of surgery, a virus is injected. The pill they take activates the virus, and it causes the virus to create uh, interleukin-12, which is a, a factor that's involved in the immune system. And what this factor does is it stimulates uh, the cells that fight infection and, and see foreign objects in the body to attack the tumor creating an immune reaction against the tumor in the hopes of um, killing or uh, destroying the disease. We're going to restart that trial in in about a month with the addition of another drug besides the virus uh, known as a checkpoint inhibitor to, to sort of have two different avenues or two different approaches to create that immune reaction against the tumor. These brain tumors have the ability to sort of hide themselves from the immune system, and some drugs that we utilize, these checkpoint inhibitors, prevent the tumors from hiding themselves. So one drug stimulates the immune reaction. The other drug unmasks the tumor from the immune system to create a robust reaction against the tumor in the hopes of killing it. That is so interesting that when you look at how this is done, at really the one cell at a time sort of approach and how everything has to be just synchronized and timed so perfectly. And, and then getting that perfect candidate to a doctor to take part in the trial is critical as well. And I'm sure there's a direct correlation uh, of proven success where something goes through the clinical trial period uh, and then before it is released on, on a larger scale basis, there's a direct connection to the level of success because you've had success at the trial period, and now it's time to take that success and, and use it to help more people. Absolutely. I mean, the goal of these clinical trials is to not only bring the most advanced treatments to currently to people who have a particular disease in the hopes of helping them, but also to gather the data to get the FDA to approve it so that it can be used on a much larger scale to help that many more uh, people with uh, whatever disease we're treating, you know, anything from diabetes to what I treat, which is, you know, uh, brain tumors. 
Uh, is the FDA process, uh, is that uh, at a pace that you would like to see, doctor? Let's say, for example, you've concluded your work in a clinical trial, and now you're ready to get the approvals and, and get this out there for people. Uh, is that a, a, can be a lengthy, kind of cumbersome process, or has that been kind of streamlined recently? Um, I think that uh, there, it has been streamlined recently. I think you've seen the FDA make some real strides in certain areas, including ours, to try to evaluate the trial data sooner and to at least uh, move it closer toward full FDA approval, whether it's, um, you know, through a special designations that they give to say, hey, this has the potential of doing some real good. The, um, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who always feel that the processes can always improve. So uh, I think when you do improve a process, and the FDA now has, you know, the, uh, the open access program for both FDA-approved drugs as well as drugs in clinical trial, you, you should always be reevaluating those processes to see if you can make it even better uh, because the sooner that we get these drugs to everybody else, you know, the more good they can do. By the same token, you don't want to prematurely rush to bring a drug out there because what you don't want to do is give hope to people that something will work and in the end you find out, you know, you were wrong or no, it's not, it's not working. That doesn't, that doesn't help anybody as well. You want to get the, the right treatment at the right time to the right patient. Yep, you're absolutely right. And uh, the websites and phone numbers that we gave at the beginning of this segment, if someone is interested in, in for more information on a trial, they could contact those people we mentioned and those websites, too, for some information about how to begin that process? Absolutely. And for clinical trials, I would definitely contact uh, Charles Porbeni uh, at JFK. All right, terrific. We'll come back. One more segment to go with Dr. Joseph Landolfi here on JFK Spotlight on Health. Grab a seat. We're going to be talking about surgical theater next. Maybe you get a, a good seat in the theater for this one, but all kidding aside, it's a very important process of what makes Dr. Landolfi and everyone at HMH so successful at what they do. We'll talk about that next on JFK Spotlight on Health. I'm Michael. And I'm April. We're husband and wife, and together, we, we lost, lost nearly 200 pounds. Do you want to know our secret? We both went to the JFK for Life Surgical Weight Loss Program. JFK for Life is a comprehensive weight management program specializing in both surgical weight loss and non-surgical weight loss. Your journey will include an entire team of clinical experts located close to home, remaining with you for ongoing encouragement and support. From nutritionists to fitness counselors to board-certified surgeons, we know it's not the amount of weight you need to lose. It's how your life will be different once you lose the weight. JFK for Life has been recognized as a center of blue distinction from Blue Cross and an Aetna Institute of Quality. Why wait? Lose weight. Visit jfkforlife.org today. Learn more about JFK for Life and the success of more than 1,000 weight loss surgeries performed. Visit jfkforlife.org and watch our free weight loss seminar at your convenience. One final segment of this week's edition of JFK Spotlight on Health. I want to thank my special guest, Dr. Joseph Landolfi, once again, taking some time out of his very busy schedule to talk to us today about what he does as the Medical Director of Neuro-Oncology at Hackensack Meridian Health, the Central and Southern Regions, and we've learned a lot on the program here today. Uh, I've heard the term also, Dr. Landolfi, surgical theater, and uh, I don't know, there's no box office when it comes to getting tickets for the surgical theater, obviously, but uh, seriously, it's something that helps you and your colleagues do your job and save that many more lives that much more effectively. Can you elaborate on what surgical theater is all about? Sure. Surgical theater is a 3D virtual reality system uh, that was brought to JFK uh, as the only hospital uh, in the state with the technology by the chairman of the department, Dr. Steinke, who uh, is a pediatric and adult neurosurgeon uh, with special interest in minimally invasive and skull-based surgery. Uh, so acoustic neuromas, meningiomas. Um, he is an integral part of the neuro-oncology program. And what surgical theater allows, it really has two uh, great purposes, in my opinion. One, it allows uh, the surgeon, whether it be Dr. Steinecke or another surgeon, to go through the patient's films in a 3D virtual reality view. So they download the patient's MRI scan, and there's a 3D rendition created where they're wearing those virtual, those big virtual reality goggles that you see everybody wear. And he's actually able to navigate his surgical approach before any surgery takes place. So he can look at different approaches. He could look at critical structures around 
whatever it is that he's going to be operating on. Certainly my interest is brain tumor, but we also treat many other diseases here, including vascular malformations of the brain, aneurysms. So it's a, it allows him to navigate completely around uh, a, a lesion or a mass to determine the best approach, what to avoid, what not to avoid, maybe modify his surgical approach. The other significant aspect of this is that he can do that with the patient. So the patient can actually see a 3D rendition of their tumor, look at the anatomy around it. Dr. Steinecke can walk them through what the surgery will be like and how he'll approach it, how he'll remove the tumor. So I, I think in addition to helping the surgeon determine the best approach, and it's actually used before you go to the OR, but then those images are downloaded in the OR as well for the surgical navigation system, the patient has the opportunity to really fully understand what it is going on. Before, we used to use the MRI scans, which are in 2D, and, you know, as you can imagine, it's, it's a lot harder to get the sense of how big something is, how it relates to the other structures of the brain when you're looking at a 2D image. It really allows them to sort of have that, that hands-on uh, in their own care to, to, to take a dive into what really needs to get done and how it gets done. That's really interesting because when you think back to the previous, I guess, generation of technology where it was simply x-rays for things like that, you could take the best sort of x-rays in the world, but the person who was in charge of reading and analyzing and being able to formulate a diagnosis based on those pictures that were taken was absolutely everything. So does this make it easier for the person who was formulating a diagnosis for a patient since they have these beautiful, crisp 3D images? Does it make that part of the process easier? I think for um, brain tumors, as far as making the diagnosis, um, the, the, the standard MRI and the, the 3D are, are probably equivalent. For vascular malformations, I think having that 3D view all around, uh, you might learn in a, in a particular aneurysm case that maybe there's another little blood that you didn't quite appreciate on the MRI. Uh, what I, where I think it has utility for everything, obviously, is to look at those structures or eloquent areas all around, so you could, you know what to avoid or what you have to be careful of, whether it be a blood vessel or a nerve, uh, and the best way the surgeon can approach uh, removing whatever it is that needs to be treated in the patient. It's amazing how technology and science kind of come together on this platform here and the difference that it makes and the lives that it saves uh, just it literally continues to absolutely amaze me. Uh, if we back up a little bit, uh, maybe just a brief discussion here, if we could, uh, about signs and symptoms uh, about brain tumor. I think about a couple of obvious ones, maybe chronic headaches, blurred vision, dizziness, things like that. Uh, is there maybe something that would maybe not indicate initially that perhaps someone could be having the early stages of a brain tumor that maybe people should be aware of? So brain tumor uh, symptoms are dependent on the location in the brain. So if somebody has uh, a lesion in the right side, say near the motor area, they're probably going to come in with weakness on one side of the body that, with or without a headache. A patient may have a seizure. Uh, that could be an indication that they have a brain tumor. Uh, as you said, dizziness, headache. Uh, there are no pain fibers within the brain, but the coverings of the brain as they stretch can cause pain. So for particularly size tumors, headaches may be a sign or symptom. Now, headaches are also very common. I mean, I have some days tension headaches, some days sinus headaches, and or migraines. So having a headache doesn't mean you have a brain tumor. It is one of the symptoms that you can see in patients with brain tumors. I think if anybody has any symptom, uh, neurological symptom of concern, they should discuss it with their treating physicians. Um, so that more information can be gathered and the appropriate course of action taken. Sometimes people present to the hospital with stroke-like symptoms where they suddenly become uh, weak and they believe they have a stroke and we discover that it's a brain tumor. And it may be because the tumor bled and caused that acute change or they had a seizure they didn't realize. So the, the signs and symptoms are uh, enormous in how they can present and it's very important that if you have any concerns to, to get your to get your treating physician or if it's particularly serious to your local emergency room. Wow, very interesting stuff. And you just said something there, Dr. Landolfi, in years of hosting this program and talking to absolutely brilliant people like yourself, you said something that I never gave a second thought to, and that's the brain itself. Uh, there's no pain sensor. So all these veins and everything in our body that all kind of converge at the brain, the brain, there's no such thing as brain pain. It doesn't exist, right? So there's no, uh, like, pain 
pain centers in the brain, so to speak. We do have a pain center that that actually everything from our whole body sort of goes up to the brain. We call it the thalamus. And, and you can have a stroke or syndromes where you get what we call central nervous system pain. So the pain is originating from the central nervous system. But uh, to sort of you know, open the brain up and cut it like they do during neurosurgery, there's no pain associated with the cutting of the brain. Uh, it has to do with the coverings and the stretching that occurs from the coverings of the brain where people would experience pain. That is so interesting. Well, Dr. Landolfi, we're just about out of time on the program today. As we wrap up, can we have that contact information once again, either websites or phone numbers that you gave earlier? Sure. There's jfkmc.org. And for uh, people who prefer the phone, as I do, uh, calling JFK Medical Center, speaking to Charles Corbeni, Patty Anthony, uh, or down at Jersey Shore, Joan Holman, uh, they can help navigate you to the right place to get in touch with the right people, including myself. All right, terrific. Medical Director of Neuro-Oncology at Hackensack Meridian Health Central in Southern Region, Dr. Joseph Landolfi. I learned a lot this week. I hope our listening audience did as well. So thank you for the time today, and hopefully we can have you back on a future program. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. I'm Bert, and you've been listening to JFK Spotlight on Health. Until next time, you have a healthy day.